So first of all, a warm welcome. Thanks for all of you for joining us. Um, let's start with a brief introduction. So I'm Mutu. Um, I'm the founder of Geo Awesomeness. And Alex. Uh, I'm Alexander Buczkowski. I'm a director uh, working at PricewaterhouseCoopers, leading the team that is uh, often uh, well, described as the coolest team across the whole firm, uh, which is a global center of excellence in drone and satellite technologies. Uh, super happy to be here and uh, discuss with you guys. Hi, I am Laura. I'm co-founder of Tilebox. Uh, so we provide a software framework for companies to develop their own data pipelines in a reliable and scalable manner. And yeah, really excited to be here. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Annette Vanya. I work for Planet Labs um, here at the seat in, in Germany. Um, and there specifically I'm working in the Earth Observation Lab, which is Planet's R&D uh, group, so to say. On, uh, and we'll talk about it, what we are doing there. So happy to be here. My name is Dubrina and I'm a product marketing manager at Up42. For those of you that don't know Up42, we are a platform and marketplace for geospatial data and analytics. Um, I will talk a little bit more about what that means uh, in a second. Uh, really excited to be here and take uh, part of this panel. Uh, hi, my name is Arnis. Uh, I work for European Agency for the Space Program. Uh, quickly, for those who are asking what exactly is this, uh, formerly we were known as GSA and uh, we're operating a Leo uh, uh, constellation of, of uh, Genesis satellites and, and the EGNOS system. And two years ago, we were renamed to uh, EUSPA and um, some additional uh, responsibilities were put on us uh, with the, within the Earth observation field. And uh, my uh, responsibilities are, are in that. I contribute on basically promoting the uptake of Copernicus uh, to, uh, to those user groups that it's not currently addressing. Thanks. OK, I think, Arnis, I don't think you need the mic. Um, maybe can you like, keep the mic to Dobrina and then check if, it, if your mic is working? No. One, one, okay. one. <laughs> it looks like the two of you would need it. But OK, um, I'm sure we will figure out a way. Um, just FYI, um, the way we've structured the panel is we basically will have 30, 40 minutes of questions with the panelists from my side. And I would love to open up the floor if you have any questions that you want to throw. Um, we will make sure that we have a second mic to run around. So keep your questions in mind, and we will get to them. Um, so let's kick things off. Um, Annette with you because you are the innovation person and you're from Planet, one of the biggest data providers out there right now. So let's start with how this observation, the imagery, the high cadence has changed environmental monitoring and reporting, especially when it comes to sustainability. Okay, so for those who don't know what Planet is doing, so we are an aerospace company and over the past decade, we have built a, set, a constellation of, of, of Earth observation satellites, so optical satellites uh, with three to four meter resolution and others, but I will mainly talk about the one, the three to four meter resolution. Um, what does it mean? Uh, our mission, so we, we started building this constellation with the mission to image the Earth once per day. And I mean image the entire land masses once per day. And we can say we, we have achieved that objective. Um, we are able today as I said, to image every point on Earth and in average have acquired um, a whole archive which consists in 2,000 images per location on Earth. And with that, we are, we are able today to provide a, uh, at a very high spatial resolution, a very high temporal um, uh, cadence of observations that allows an almost real-time monitoring. So I think it's, um, we are making that data available through to our customers, but also through specific programs like the NICFI program, which is uh, the Norway, Norwegian uh, International Climate and Forest Initiative to map, for example, um, the whole tropical forest. Um, so, so it's basically, we, come, we take the best um, image shots from these um, daily image acquisitions to combine monthly mosaics, and through this provide um, access to and enable users to monitor the tropical forests, which are the Earth's lungs, um, on a relatively high cadence, and that globally. So, I mean, this is um, just to say that it's the high spatial resolution, yeah. but high temporal cadence, and also making that data available through our platform and through specific access programs. 
and how has this like for how your customers who are working and reporting people like PwC um, made a difference? Alex, do you think that the high cadence is a major selling point for environmental reporting? You know, so uh, yes and no, right? So environment does not change overnight, right? So so you don't really need to monitor it on a on a daily basis, but you need to have a high trust for the data that it provides. So the more data that you have to verify the the, the results of your analysis, the better, right? So uh, yeah. I think it also depends on the type of applications. It's true you don't need it for each um, application. For example, for crop monitoring, you, a higher cadence is definitely more useful considering the, the dynamics of a crop. Um, for other changes, it might not be necessary, but by just having the possibility to access a, an image every day, it also allows you an almost real time, or it, it provides you the possibility to monitor something change happening whenever you need it. So not. Yeah the need to wait for an image to be acquired, let's say, in a week or so, but to rather also, it gives you the tool to, to react also in almost near real time, so to say. Interesting. Dobrina, you know, given that, that you at Up42 focus on a platform-driven approach, how do you think the user requirements, the fact that, that now we have high cadence imagery is shaping the industry, um, is it meeting the needs of the ESG reporting industry, or do you think there has to be more done? in terms of the data, in terms of the approach, in terms of the APIs that are available? So, yeah, working at Up42 and, of course, representing a platform and a marketplace, I think for me, yeah, this is a lot has been done already, uh, but even more can be done when it comes to data access, standardization of data. Um, uh, so when it comes, for example, to data standardization, that's a very important topic for us uh, at Up42 and very topic closer to my heart. Uh, so adopting geospatial standards to make it easier uh, to work with uh, data. So for example, stack standards, cloud optimized geotiff. So for me, that's, uh, that's a topic where we, we will continue to see more advances um, and more can be done. Uh, but also, yeah, making it uh, easier also to access more data sets. So we talked a lot about, uh, we gave some examples, but more data sets, especially when it comes to sustainability, for example, thermal data, um, making, more, uh, imp uh, making more out of SAR data as well, uh, but uh, as well yeah, as hyperspectral data are also topics that I'm personally very excited and I think we will see more in the future and more can be done uh, to really, yeah, um, make sure that we uh, benefit from Earth observation data and unlock the social economic benefits for everyone. So Arnes, maybe switching more from, like say, the corporate perspective to more the European governmental scientific perspective. At USPA, one of your main directives is to drive market access, to drive more applications, right? So you have high cadence imagery from Planet, you have data platforms like Up42. How does USPA approach these problems? How do you make access to data easier? What, what is your approach? The general approach is, uh, of course, to, to look at, uh, at the, what's needed, <laughs> and not to go from the, from the technology push approach, but try to, to follow this uh, uh, need-led uh, approach. Of course, in the, in the sphere of sustainability, a regulatory uh, push is, is, is there. We have, uh, since it's, it's a, you know, the tragedy of the commons, it's an economic problem that we're in with the climate change, with the, with the uh, emission, and we have to, we have to somehow uh, think that together. The, 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 the needs are, are there, but they are driven by, by regulators outside beyond the use space policy. And we are there on the somewhat solution side, and we might help with some of the EU uh, space program elements like Galileo, like Copernicus, uh, uh, but also uh, take uh, wider industry and support adoption of, of methods uh, at wider industry. And I must say that I see that the current regulation across the, the, the uh, elements of Green Deal, it doesn't follow really a prescriptive approach. It, it follows uh, where you prescribe technology, how to either uh, enforce a, a regulation it leaves the open how you can comply and prove that you are you're actually uh, uh, complying with the with the ethos of regulation. 
and uh, I think that's, that com creates confusion on the industry side, on the user side, but that should be looked as an opportunity to actually innovate and, and not to be tied into some prescribed technologies. Not to get into precise technologies, and Arne spoke about the market pull, and Laura, you are a startup, you've raised a seed round to make space data infrastructure easily accessible. So with your goal to revolutionize the space data management, what challenges do you see in the market? Why did you enter the market and what are you trying to solve? Yeah, so common challenges we've seen is first, fast and high performance access to data uh, in a way that it also uh, improves the developer experience of working with that data. And by data, I mean um, raw payload data, telemetry, ADCS, and so on. So we come a little bit earlier on that. Um, yeah, we've seen companies facing delays of months just to access uh, a subset of their data. Um, and yeah, and this has consequences uh, on de delays on product development and also revenue generation. Another common pitfall and, and, and challenges that we see is how to effectively um, distribute work across infrastructure. So how to schedule near real-time products in a way that reduces friction between the teams that are currently working on those products, that it reduces manual input, and that it's also scalable, whether you have one satellite or 15. Um, and the last one that I've seen is basically how to also effectively reduce the data volumes that need to be downlinked. Um, so basically onboard processing right now means scripts that call out coprocessors. Uh, and we really think there is a lot of um, room of improvement in there. And that's something that, at least at Tilebox, we are, we are working right now. Yeah. I mean, we, we have on the panel two of the biggest data providers in Planet and in USPA. Is this a problem that you're also tackling? Should Laura be concerned about your efforts internally to make this infrastructure easily available? Or is she working on a problem that's kind of outside your purview? Maybe, Annette, do you want to start? Yeah, no, I think for us, for sure, as we are producing a lot of data on a daily basis, it has been part of our evolution also to, I mean, the, the scope, the focus was also, or the objective was to be able to serve that data also as it is uh, acquired. So we have moved away from this um, being a data provider, satellite, building satellites, data, providing data only towards um, what we call in our North Star um, strategy, um, Earth Data Platform. So. It's clearly um, our idea also to, to provide these data sets together even with first derived insights to enable a customer to build their application on top of it. So for sure, this platform aspect, also accessing data, building applications that are scalable without the need to download it, et cetera, so not doing it the old way, <laughs> um, is definitely one of the things we are trying to tackle. And um, because of that, we, we have recently also uh, joined forces with Synergize, who has built the Sentinel Hub, which is one of the Earth Data platforms um, providing this processing capacity also. So, because we thought together we could reach um, the goal much faster than we can as, as planet only. So for sure, it is something that's in our genes also how to how to deal with these aspects. And I think, um, yeah, I think that that is an evolving. Um, I'd say domain for sure, continuously challenged by the amounts of data volume that, mm. that are produced by the different actors. So, yeah. Ernest, do you want to react? Yeah, uh, just to, to, I, I wouldn't uh, put us as opposing uh, on opposing sides the, the industry in general and uh, and for example Copernicus as a, as a public. Uh, publicly owned Earth observation system because at the end of the day, uh, Copernicus is actually built by the industry itself at the end of the day. And what, what is there, uh, the public remains, uh, retains control over this, this thin layer of, of, of uh, and, and some ownership of, of the technology, but so to ensure long-term viability of, of, of the system, which is very crucial for, for multiple policies both in, with relation to the Green Deal, to safety, security. So uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's the industry that builds. And if the industry can offer some, something better, better components, that Copernicus will also improve. But it will remain as, as, as some uh, basically essentially a, a public service, but built on, on, on industry. Interesting. 
Alex, as a, as, a, as a person who's working in the consultancy industry, how is this data aspect of it, the access of it, what Laura is working on, how does it affect you? Is this a problem that you face or is it somehow mitigated because of the amounts of data that you use? No, I mean, no, working with data at scale is always difficult, right? You need to have the right tools, the right you know, processes, the right processing capabilities. So the more solutions there are that actually you know, enable you to automate the work and make your life easier and you know, uh, uh, make uh, other the, the work of people uh, you know, automated and let them focus on actually the, the hard stuff on you know, the, the analyzing the data and thinking about all of the you know, applications and getting the right insights and knowledge out of it rather than you know, processing and tools and all the things that are really you know, redundant and that we don't really need to, we, we, shouldn't, we, we shouldn't really need to you know, focus on it. This is, this is something that you know, big organizations are looking for. And we also don't want to have all of this data stored in-house, right? We want to use uh, planet servers or solutions such as uh, platforms such as App42 or different tools that will enable us to, to, to process it at scale. At the end, what matters is not really you know, the data and the processing, but the insights and the knowledge that you are deriving out of this data, right? And this is what is really creating the value, right? So uh, the, the, the consulting sector is always where the value or focuses on where the value is, right? So this is why we are often using you know, different solutions and tools that, that you guys uh, provide and offer. Laura, getting back to you, was it your experience so far from investors? Do they ask you similar questions in terms of who your competitors are? Or is it more that the value understanding is already there in the market when it comes to space data and access to it? Both. We organically started bootstrapped, so we saw the need and we started building towards that need. Uh, we got early customers and then of course once things start going, you really need to, it's, it's a big issue, right? So you want to grow fast and you wanna, you, you want to be able to capture clients and to deliver to them. So that's why then when investors ask, uh, yeah, the market is ready, the market is there and it just keeps growing. If you think about the projections of, of amounts of data that are going to come, it just keeps increasing. Data never reduces. So we better have good tools in place to, to be able to handle it efficiently. That's interesting. So we've spoken uh, quite a bit about um, data and now I want to shift gears a bit and go into a topic that not a lot of people are interested in but I'm personally really interested in which is policy making and Arnest you have a lot of experience in remote sensing and you've been working for a new agency for a while now so how is earth observation data like influencing policy making at the EU level especially now given the new EU deforestation rule are there going to be more such earth observation driven policy making what's your opinion well, um, of course, uh, the Earth observation data does influence policy by informing policymakers. Policymakers have to be informed in order to make uh, reasonable policies. Uh, uh, so, and, and Copernicus, as, as one of the Earth observation systems, uh, a global one, uh, does, does contribute a lot with the with the very long time series, for example, of, of climatic parameters, of envir uh, environmental bio geobiophysical parameters. And uh, if you have a baseline, you can actually assess if, if something is, is changing and in, in, in impact of the policies is, is, uh, is being achieved. In some other aspects, you have to uh, look at the impact of policies, but you also have to enforce for some of the policies. And there, sometimes the, the information has to be much more detailed, much more local. And I see that there is uh, lots of opportunities for, for other providers, maybe who don't have the the the, uh, the global look as we have. Uh, and then, do you, Alex, do you agree? Do you, as a, as a, from a consultancy perspective, do you also see policy making as a tool that can drive the use of Earth observation for sustainability for ESG reporting? Yeah, I mean, for, for sure, right? However, uh, so how, how, it's, how it's defined today, I mean, the, the policies do not say that you should use Earth observation data, right? The policies say what you need to report. Uh, however, like when you, you gave the example of uh, the deforestation policy, 
So there is no other way to monitor it uh, effectively at scale than to, to do it using uh, air observation data, right? So on, on one hand, the, the, the policy is not defining it. I think you've complained about this uh, a, a little bit initially. And on the other hand, no, it is pushing the industry to use uh, this data. Uh, which indeed creates some confusion and you know, lack of standardization uh, and, and so on. But on the other hand, you know, this, is, this is something that we see you know, gradually you know, kind of you know, growing and adopting. And there are always first adopters that, that want to you know, establish some sort of standards or pre precedents you know, on you know, how, do you, how do you report and then others are, are following. So, this is something that is right now organically happening, and you now we see some of the, the the big players on the market already uh, reporting on it using air observation uh, data. I mean, for a while now. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, um, Dobrina, do you see an uptick in more clients looking for data, especially because of the new regulation? I, I would say yes. So, for example, uh, with the new regulations now that um, come with sustainability uh, focus this year, there is definitely more and more interest. But for me, in addition to the policy, something that I wanted to mention now, it's also we shouldn't forget uh, that one of the main objectives that we should be all doing is really making it easier than ever to really access data and work with it, um, in, in, um, extract insights from the data at scale. So uh, not only focuses on what the policies are there, uh, and there are plenty, of course, uh, for deforestation, also a lot of uh, policies when it comes to mining and other industries. Uh, but really, like with thought leadership, showing the use cases, showing what you can do with the data, and enabling more and more downstream integration um, applications for um, for customers. I think that's also where we can influence uh, a lot, and uh, yeah, we can do a lot, especially with platforms and marketplaces like Up42. And it does such policies somehow influence the algorithms that you try out at the EO Lab, or is it doesn't really matter because the policies are always a few years late? and your work is always a few years ahead? I mean, I think for sure we are watching also, uh, or be, we are aware of what the policy is recommending, but I think we are also an ambassador in that sense that through the data and what we see customers do with the data, what we think we can do with the data, we are also um, communicating clearly about the, the potential the data set has, and I think it's it's maybe not the policy directly recommending to use earth observation data, but there's also I see it in the disaster framework, um, in, the, in the disaster domain, there is the Sendai framework where it was clearly also recommended to use earth observation data to monitor disasters. You said it in the deforestation uh, context. So I think also in CUP, so agricultural monitoring, earth observation data is recognized as a, as a data source because it's, it's a neutral, um, data source which has a lot of power if interpreted uh, correctly. So of course, that's always the last mile. But um, for sure, this is mm, we are happy to see that it is continuously picked up as a, as a data source. Um, not because we sell Earth observation data, but also because we believe in the power this data set has. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess everyone today, when we were walking around into Geo, we saw a lot of drones. And when we talk about Earth observation, we tend to sometimes only focus on satellites and not the drone aspect of it. And Alex, luckily for me, um, works a lot with drone data. Surprise, surprise. So how do you see this, the aspect of drones? Is it more complementary or is it already challenging satellite-based observations in different industries, especially when it comes to, again, ESG and sustainability reporting, insurance, for example? Yeah, I mean, so, so the, the two data sources are fully complementary, right? And basically serving different purposes and different use cases, right? So you would not use drones to monitor on a you know, large scale area types of challenges, for example, you know, deforestation, right? You'd use satellite data to do that, but when you want to report, I don't know, on 
specific emissions generated by your uh, set of factories in a, in a given areas, then you know, drones would provide you with the right payload, the right sensors to actually you know, do that. So these are you know, two totally different uh, uh, data sources uh, serving totally different use cases. Unfortunately, you know, the, the market you know, very often see it a, a little bit as a competing data sources, why I, I think it, it, it should not be treated this way. Uh, these are basically totally, totally different. And I mean, we are working towards educating the markets which data uh, would be you know, the, the optimal for, for which specific use cases and which scale of use. Yeah. The, the entire time that you were speaking, Dobrina was agreeing to you, so I was... Do, what do you think? Do you also are a big fan of drones? Do you want to see more drone data? Of course. So I'm personally, of course, biased, right? But I fully agree with what you were saying, Alex, right? The complementary approach. So for me, using, for example, satellite data to monitor at scale, whether it's uh, deforestation or infrastructure monitoring, and then really using drone or other uh, area of resources to uh, focus on more or smaller AOI, I think can really uh, improve efficiency, save resources, save costs. Um, so yeah, I'm also a full believer um, for that complementary approach, and I really don't see it as either or. Uh, yeah, so just that's why I was nodding on the whole time. Uh, regardless of the use case, I think there is a lot of opportunity for um, using level, different types of remote sensing data. Laura, how is it a tile box? Of course, as a startup, you have to focus somewhere, so you're focusing on space data, but do you also see yourself able to work with drone data or do you see it as a completely different challenge? No, definitely, definitely. I think they have, they have similarities in terms that hey, for, from both drone and satellite you get raw data and you get telemetry data from drones, probably from several drones, and then you need a, a flexible and high performance system to create other products. So that's similar. One difference that I see currently is that um, the process on how to get the data close to scalable compute. So in the case of satellites, they benefit from an uh, established network of uh, space service providers and ground stations that have high bandwidth towards cloud services. And I think in this case, maybe for drones, um, it's more relevant on-premise deployments. So that's one of the differences that, that I currently see. Let's, let's stay with scalable computing. Do you think as an industry, do we make maximum use of scalable computing, or do you think like there is a lot of room for improvement. Um, I think there is use, there is there is use made of that, but I think there is room of improvement in okay. terms of how to um, schedule it properly, how to not uh, die out of cloud costs, uh, and yeah, how to how to more effectively process data. That's basically one of the cores of Tilebox. How to more effectively in a distributed manner, which is one of the cores of Tilebox across clusters and across even clouds, how to distribute that data processing. Yeah, interesting. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have Laura on the panel, because as an industry, whether you call it your uh, spatial or earth observation, we tend to focus a lot on the data, but not on the computing aspect of it. And I think we can learn a lot from computer science. So we've been speaking a lot about data, so maybe we should switch a bit more into the computing, the AI aspect of it. And I'm going to start off with you, Dubrina. Um, what is like for you at, as a data-driven platform, as a you know, geospatial marketplace, how do you see AI algorithms? What are the new technologies that you see popping up in your marketplace? Uh, so for me, like platforms and marketplace can play a very important role in really removing the technical and economic barriers that still exist, unfortunately, to accessing uh, geospatial data. Uh, so some of the new things that I'm personally uh, excited about is uh, more and more data sets that are coming up. I did mention um, uh, when, when we were talking at the beginning of the panel, uh, thermal data sets, uh, also hyperspectral. So for me, those uh, uh, data sets, regardless of the use case, whether it's uh, monitoring efficiency of solar panels, whether it's uh, obviously wildfire, a uh, huge topic right now, uh, with availability and more and more data sets like this, I think they will play a huge role when it comes to um, sustainability. Um, also, for me, 
we did touch a little bit briefly on that, but combining different types of data sets, so whether that's optical and SAR, or also, uh, as we just talked about, using potentially satellite data and then more targeted um, drone um, uh, data for a more specific AOI, something that I'm really excited to see. Uh, and I also did mention at the beginning geospatial data standards. That's personally something that um, I think there is need for more standards, uh, whether it, when it comes to AI and adopting AI for um, at scale, uh, but also yeah, when it comes to really like making it easy to work with uh, geospatial data. So I think companies are still struggling with different data types, different data formats. So standards such as uh, cloud optimized geotiffs is something that I'm yeah personally really excited about, and I think something that we'll see more and more of. Um, Arnes, how do you see it? How is USPA tackling AI in Earth observation? Is this the topic for you at USPA? Um, directly, uh, we are not engaged with producing any of the Copernicus services. While we are working at uh, facilitating reuse of that, and there, of course, we, would, we, we want to and can facilitate the use of any method, including machine learning, uh, to, to, to create value. And we have actually some instruments uh, in Horizon Europe calls uh, that some of them are actually open now. So check it out and maybe uh, you, you, your company institution can, can contribute somehow. Are you to, aware of any um, open calls right now where startups yeah, there, can apply are, where AI is a topic? Exactly, yeah. yeah. It, the, but, uh, you know, AI is like a, a, is a, is a method that can be applied to almost anything and uh, to, be, to do things better in a way. And, um, and therefore, I see it as a pervasive technology that should be everywhere uh, with caveats, of course. Uh, for example, I've seen in some safety uh, critical applications, uh, there are additional requirements towards application of AI, for example. Uh, but uh, that's already like application specific and we don't go there. Alex, how do you see the use of AI in the industry? With we're either in the drone industry for autopilot applications or also in the satellite industry? No, so, so I mean, obviously, this is a big promise of future automation, right? And today, AI is good at solving some you know, simple problems, right? So, for example, detecting you no know, forest, right? This is a fairly simple problem. But it's still not there when it comes to, you know, solving more complex problems you know, with objects that are more diverse and you know, different uh, environments uh, uh, and so on. Right? So uh, I, I, I would wish that we would be able to do much more with deep learning today. Uh, but the reality shows that you know, there is still a lot of human interaction and analysis today required to, to work to solve these more, more uh, complex problems. But I think that we are also at the beginning of this uh, journey. So when we look at what happened over the course of the last year with generative AI, right, and you know, things that are discussed in the industry where you, know, you, you would be able to you know, ask any query to, to satellite data and you know, receive some meaningful you know, answers. So, so I think that this revolution is actually still uh, ahead of us, uh, and uh, the the real value that that will come with the using satellite data at scale will still I mean it's st still not not really you know used. We are just scratching the the, the, the surface for now. So uh, I expect a lot actually yeah. in the next uh, three to five years. Uh, in terms of the automation that is uh, that is about to happen, and no, the, the the whole value that will be extracted, I mean, both from from satellite data and and when it comes to automation related to drone data. Okay, speaking of generative AI, just a quick show of hands: who of you has been using ChatGPT the last couple of weeks, months? Okay, more or less everybody. So, Anna, so everybody is using ChatGPT. When can we expect something similar from Planet so that we can just type our Earth observation query? We are thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, it's one of the topics which, in my group especially, because it's, uh, we are, there are several machine learning engineers, experts in deep learning, um, also thinking, seeing what, what is coming to the market, how we can combine our Earth observation data with other sources, 
to, as you say, just type, find me uh, my house or find me, I don't know, tell me what's the yield of that, uh, of that field, type it and get it. Uh, so that, that's one of the thinking. We are not working on it right now, but it is definitely something which is on, in our minds. Um, but with, with the archive, I take our example now that, that we have built over the years, um, an archive of six, of six years, basically. Um, it's calling to use machine learning to be exploited, to, to use artificial intelligence. And that's what, what we are working on specifically also in the Earth Observation Lab. We are looking at how we can leverage that archive, train models with this historical, uh, basically, yeah, this historical information and then uh, see how we can apply uh, that to a downstream application. So basically not use any label, but train a model, and then ask it to classify crops or find me the change in that area, for example, a, a change in, in the built-up area, and then see how we can use these technologies also to get that information quickly. Um, and then, as I said before, no, help customers build applications um, also using, leveraging that technology. So also combining it with other sensors, so not only other information, but also other Earth observation centers, which is what we are also doing um, to, to derive insights, uh, which we call planetary variables, um, where we're not using only our data, but also leveraging the Copernicus, um, so these more reference sensors from Copernicus or Landsat um, to derive to add value and to make the best out of these data sets and use machine learning also to build do this sense of fusion and, and modeling. Yeah. Take a quick second, but I would like to get all of your opinions on this. Um, just take a mental second, also you, just to have it in mind. Um, how long do you think it will take before we have something like ChatGPT with observation data? I'm going to start with you, Annette. I don't think it will take very long. <laughs> but okay, what's Are we not talking very five long? years? Ah, no. Three, two? No. Uh, Two, yeah. Two years, Dobrina. If you had to bet your entire house and all your savings, I would also agree. Two to three years. Arnest. I think we are there. Like last week, I had. I'm. I'm writing code three days per year, so I. I can formulate a prompt or a question, but I. I forget the syntax. So, last week I had to write a, a function to analyze some. Uh, some data set. Uh, and uh, ChatGPT was good at it. I, I formulate a, a correct uh, prompt and I get a function that works. I can get my stuff done. It's amazing. It's there. <laughs> Laura? I'm also optimistic and I think probably before the next Intergeo, we're going to find some companies already showcasing some cases like this. So, yeah. I think it's so, going to be fast. Uh, as a professional person who is always guesstimating. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I, would, I would wish to be that optimistic uh, as you, so I, I think that no, it, it, it will help us with solving specific you know, questions, count number of cars, count number of people, count number of trees, but with you know, giving uh, kind of more meaningful answers when it comes to you know, extracting knowledge, not extracting kind of information. Uh, I think that there is a long way to, 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 to go, right? I mean, so, uh, I mean, it's still years to come. I'm, I'm curious to hear later on how close where you were or if you had a different opinion. I'm more or less at the end of my question, so I will open up the floor, so think about your questions. Um, so, Laura, back to you. Um, how does Tilebox infrastructure management potentially change the game for EO? Yeah, so, well, basically, Tilebox is an abstraction layer that runs on top of uh, infrastructure, like, for example, Google Cloud provides, right? Um, so what it does is that it allows companies to develop their in-house data pipelines, but already at a scale and in a very reliable manner. So one of the things that we do, um, link linking it now to the challenges that we talked before, is that we offer unified access um, that is compatible to space service providers. So any company that is launching, Right after commissioning, they get access to their data and they can immediately develop products. 
Um, we also, Tilebox also does all the infrastructure management. That means uh, deployment, scaling, load balancing. So companies can just, again, focus on creating their products and not battling infrastructure um, in a very distributed manner. So running their pipelines uh, across different clusters and different clouds. And this comes very handy, for example, in, in cases of data fusion, when you have data from different sensors stored in different locations, right? Uh, and moving that data around is very costly. So uh, we offer this possibility to process close to where the data is stored. Um, then another difference that we, that we bring is that we deploy directly on the customer's account. So the customer keeps full control of their data and algorithms. Um, yeah, and the next step that we are working on is to lift uh, Tilebox from the ground to in orbit. So customers can deploy software or will be able to deploy software in space the same way they would do it on the ground. They can start their data pipelines directly on the payload um, or directly on data centers in the space uh, and then continue on the ground, reducing volumes, reducing light latency, and at the end, basically reaching their customers way faster. So that's, that's basically what we are working on right now. And, and how do you see this, Dobrina? Because you also operate in a similar space where you make it easier, so the APIs and so on. Do you think products like Laura's can make the Up42 offering even better, reach a bigger audience? Uh, yeah, I would be yeah, very excited to see how this could happen. I mean, I think we, uh, uh, there is a potential for uh, collaboration, cooperation, so definitely. Uh, for me, as I mentioned, uh, the access, the infrastructure uh, that we need uh, to really like process geospatial data, extract insights at scale is really what's uh, going to change the industry. So, yeah, I think definitely. Arnes, you are a person who programs in addition to working at USPA. So how do you see this? Is it something also exciting for you? Does it make your life better to have such a distributed platform? Um, partly, uh, yeah, uh, actually, could you repeat the question? Because actually, I do not hear you quite well, to be honest. Okay, so it, I think much, now it's much way better, louder. Much better. <laughs> so my question was to you, how, how does distributed infrastructure, like what Laura offers, changes things for you? Does it make it easier for you as a programmer? Um, well, at, at USPA level, we're quite uh, several layers of abstraction from, from that because the, the, the data from Sentinels, uh, data from Copernicus services by ECMWF, JRC, uh, European Environment, uh, Environmental Agency, uh, they are the ones building the, the products with the help of the industry. And there has been a shift from private cloud to, to using public clouds, which are much more scalable. And of course, w that goes together with, with processing on cloud, of, 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 of course. And there were several initiatives, the CDSC, Copernicus Data Access Ecosystem, uh, run by ESA, uh, to facilitate this processing on, on cloud uh, for, the, for the Sentinel data. And um, yeah. so there, there is effort to, to, to address this obvious problem with, the, with, the, with our data. Yeah, glad to hear that. So Alex, coming back to you, you've got a lot of decades of experience engaging with the community. Thank you. You are just <laughs> confirming that I'm old. Um, <laughs> so what's one pressing topic in EO that deserves more attention, in your opinion? No, so so what I'm particularly, I mean, I'm excited about a lot of different you know, uh, uh, things. Like you know, when I think about the, the archives that you know, Planet has, you, you've mentioned about this, and I mean, how much knowledge is really you know, there still to be discovered you know, about different you know, processes that are happening on the, on the planet. And you know, it is really you know, fascinating. But uh, what, what, what fascinates me is how the resolution is uh, improving. So today we've got eight companies providing, I think, 12 satellites that offer 30 centimeters uh, resolution uh, satellite data. In 2027, we are expected to have 131 satellites providing you know, uh, 30 centimeters uh, data resolution. So now it will, I mean, besides the fact that it's still very, very expensive uh, to, to access and you know, a lot of people on the market are complaining about this, 
there is enormous amount of uh, new use cases that that you know, that will be unlocked. You can imagine things like you know monitoring, I don't know ports, right? Today, when you've got uh, two or three satellite images a day, you not, you, are, you are not able to 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 you know, like do the efficient monitoring. But if you will have a satellite image taken every 10 minutes. Like it will be enough to, to to basically unlock a lot of different use cases that are not really viable today. I mean, there it, there will be a lot of challenges related to you know, managing, of course, there's terabytes or petabytes. I mean, tsunami of data that 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 will be that will be out there. But it's fascinating, you know, what kind of new possibilities it will it will give us. And no, hopefully, how easy, easily it will be accessible because with competition on the market, no comes also uh, no more focus on the on the customer and no perhaps competing on the on the price and on availability of this data. And I mean, I just hope that it will not go into government capacity, but it will also come to the commercial market. I want to get the opinion of the others as well, but maybe we need to open up the floor for questions. So if you can keep it short, Arnes, one or two sentences, what do you think is the one pressing challenge in geo or in Earth observation today? I see it as, as the last mile, because often technology is there. It, it, it's been proven. It works. It's the adoption is limited by, by often uh, lack of uh, uh, the limitations in, in the regulation or accepted means of compliance that do not envisage the usage of, of methods beyond the traditional ones. I see that's an opportunity uh, that, that can be worked on at the pan-European or national levels. Thanks. Um, Dobrina, do you see a similar challenge or do you see another pressing point that need to tackle? I think there is there are a lot of pressing challenges. Definitely agree with everything that was said. For me, it's also maybe number one, continue with thought leadership, educational content, really showcase what can be done with the data to really like demonstrate the use cases and show how really customers can benefit commercial, of course, use cases. And of course, uh, making sure we continue to make uh, the access to data, to the infrastructure and to the processing algorithms needed to um, make sense of that data. So I think for me, those would be the two uh, main challenges and opportunities. Laura, what do you see as the pressing points? Where do you see opportunities? Well, the bigger challenge that we see right now is how to, as I mentioned, effectively process these amounts of data that just keep increasing and how to unlock new use cases uh, through either data fusion or even integrating uh, complex algorithms and AI or machine learning modules. So in this case, also modularity is very important and reusability is very important. So those are the biggest, the biggest things that I see coming up. And it, besides having the, the need for more data, because I think you want to say more data, but what would be another pressing challenge? I think from a maybe a completely different, very technical aspect um, down to the actual analysis, a big challenge which I keep seeing in the work we do in the Earth Observation Lab is um, giving value to the information we derive, for which we rely or depend a lot in the Earth Observation sector on ground truth. Um, and I think there's a lot of ground truth out there, but we are not able to, to access it. So I think this is a bit of a challenge depending on, on the domain. And for example, in agriculture, it's super difficult. Um, so I think there, I see we can still do a lot to also make use of that data to also to provide better Earth observation-based products um, because they are more reliable. We can train models much better with a higher accuracy. So I think that's, for me, that's close to my heart because of what we do and because that is a daily challenge also for us. I really like that answer. Yeah. So that's more or less all I had for questions. I'm, I wanted to open up the floor for more questions from your side. Juliana is there with a the mic. Um, does any of you have a question? Possibly I have to take this one. Yeah. Or were you Please. completely satisfied with the questions that I had and you don't want to ask any more questions? <laughs> was, was it a question? No. OK. Then. May I have a question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, 
I feel very much reminded when it comes to some of the facts that you delivered right now, or the information on the discussion we had um, with um, open data and smart cities. So is there something we can learn? Because this was a process that happened already a few years ago, and perhaps we can learn with it about data that we can use for the whole earth. So I don't know, but perhaps you have an idea for that. So you mean the, the challenge to... We, we have so many data when it comes to, to cities, mm -hmm. so oh. many different data. And we speak about different data about the earth. So, and the question is, can't we learn from the process that happened there already during the last few years and how to deal with it and um, who owns the, the data and who can deal with it. And so a lot of processes, it, it, uh, these are the same questions that were, were there. So in, in, in a sense, the, I think the question goes more towards can we adopt some of the open data yeah. practices, That's the it. standards that were adopted yeah. by the smart cities um, towards Earth observation? Yeah, that's really I don't know, but this is, it, it's another level. So this is a smaller level. Yeah. We speak about cities and we speak yeah. about um, Denmark as a very digital country. We, we, today we heard that um, they have a, nearly a digital twin, so we are very close to it. And now we speak about Earth data. Perhaps one day we will have a digital twin of the Earth. How cool would be that? But to deal with that, we first have to know, okay, what do we do with it at the end? How can we change it? Why is it achievable at the end? But how can we do it? How is the path to it? And what can we learn from cities? Because it's much, much smaller, much more handleable. <laughs> it's a big question, I know, but <laughs> it raised in my head. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I make a comment. Like, uh, it's a general question, so a general comment. Uh, uh, it, it's good that you are building uh, solutions in, in cities, and then you think that it's a digital twin is coming. Uh, uh, it's going to emerge basically as a set of, of small solutions. Each of them will be essentially a simple solution for a simple problem, perhaps. But once you uh, have a set, large set of those working together through open stand data standards, fair, uh, fair data, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data, uh, that will at some point emerge as digital twin, basically. So it's a set of simple solutions. That, that's my take on this. Does anybody have an, a comment or an addition to it? I'm personally also interested to see the use cases that Earth observation data enables. So when we talk about smart cities, of course, planning cities in a smarter way. Uh, we're talking here about sustainability today, so to reduce emissions. So that's just something that yeah, I would like to see more and more of. Uh, yeah, that would I think it's, it's very sector depending, no? Um, I, I gave the example of agriculture before. We, I think we're, we're not managing to convince also the agricultural industry farmers to share their data because maybe we, we don't manage to communicate <laughs> what's the benefit of doing that. No? So um, I don't know how we can overcome it personally, but um, it, yeah, <laughs> it, maybe the cities are a good example. <laughs> This is why it came to my head mm. to speak about smart cities, because when we, when we look at um, Copenhagen, mm. that was, um, as far as I know, they, they opened their data and they gave it to everyone. And then it was a surprisingly high number of new apps and new solutions that came out of this process um, that nobody expected before. And that might be happen when you, as you said, just leave the data to, to, uh, or let us access have more access for more people to the data and let's see what will happen and um, that might be one solution that's why I said can we learn from that yeah. what happened there in a small in a smaller way for, for this bigger way <laughs> I, I guess your words are um, music to the years of the open geospatial consortium that's working a lot on data standards and so on um, so yeah right um, as we came onto the stage, uh, Juliana mentioned to me uh, we are in Germany and we are already a few minutes late. <laughs> and I was so happy that we might finish on time and I can say, yeah, I finished right exactly on time, but we didn't. We are a few minutes late. But I really enjoyed it. So thanks a lot to you, Alex, Laura, Annette, Dobrina and Ernest. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And I hope you guys had a good time and you learned something new or at least you had a lot of fun to joining us this evening. So thanks a lot. Bring a lot of applause from my panelists. Bravo for the host. <laughs>